angle coming down at me. Hey, apologies, everyone. Um, well, we know it works because I already gave an opening keynote, but uh, sorry I'm late to the party. Clearly, my laptop was blown away by Emma's previous presentation. So uh, congratulations, Emma, and I'm glad I could make it. I think I actually got kicked out because everyone else joined before I could. Um, anyway, let, let's kick this off. I'm running out of time. So hello, everyone. I'm Alex. Uh, you might remember me from early on uh, in this conference. Um, I gave eighth opening keynote. But for those of you who aren't familiar with me, um, I'm director of business development at a company called Engine. We provide a suite of developer tools and products uh, to enable anyone to leverage blockchain assets into their virtual worlds. Uh, a lot of games, but also a lot of enterprises are our clients. Um, and I work with uh, more than 40 developer teams using our tools uh, to build games and other projects. But this evening, we're going to move on from the blockchain space. We have a fantastic panel and talk to four absolute leaders in the world of um, digital economies. Um, and so I'd like to kick it off by asking everyone to introduce yourselves, uh, your role, and you know, what your company is involved with. Let's kick off with Mason. You seem to be nodding enthusiastically there. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Uh, so my name is Mason Nystrom. I'm a research analyst at a crypto asset data uh, and research provider called Masari. And you can kind of think of us as the Bloomberg for crypto. So we have a lot of analytics uh, specifically of the more liquid assets like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Fantastic. And who should I pick on next? Tony. I'm Tony Wan, Director of Player Support from Epic Games, makers of Fortnite, Unreal Engine, etc. And Oliver, hi. Hi, I'm Oliver. I'm a Chief Commercial Officer of Lockwood Publishing. We run a large 3D virtual world on mobile called Avacant Life, where we sell about 2.3 million uh, items every day. All right, Susan, I think you, you had record, um, record user numbers of more than 200 million, was it, over the summer this year? Yeah. So That's ever, ever growing platform as well. Um, absolutely amazing. Well, mobile, everybody has a mobile phone, right? So. <laughs> and finally, you, Alexei. Uh, my name is Alexei. I, uh, I'm director of uh, marketing communications at Blizzard Entertainment. I uh, make uh, so of World of Warcraft, Diablo, Starcraft, uh, Heroes of the Storm. All the great games. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're obviously all very familiar with you know, observing um, your consumer behavior around digital assets. Uh, so I want to start off with uh, a question about what is, what is the watershed moment for you when you realize that you know, these digital economies are going to be you know, much, much bigger than you uh, sort of initially realized. Um, and for me, it was, I think, in the 2012, realizing that the League of Legends winners individually won more than the winners of Wimbledon, um, you being a London citizen that year. And I, I was just like, wow, why are people not talking about this? This is, this is you know, you can be the best tennis player in the world and you're, you're taking away lower winnings than, you know, the best, um, you know, one of the top five or 10 League of Legends players. Um, so, Tony, I think we, we discuss this question actually between us. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts to kick that off. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I'd love to see it was back when I was a, when I was a teenager and, and a friend of mine uh, won a Ferrari for, for participating in esports. But um, I think actually thinking about it as an adult and the business side of it um, didn't really come to me until uh, I was actually part of Riot of uh, working on League of Legends and supporting it and looking at all of the additional businesses that spun out of a single IP. And, you know, it's a, it's a game that is free to play, but the major money maker for it is cosmetics, um, you know, skins. And that is, um, has, has you know, given birth to all of the additional lines of business. We're talking now about advertisements and collaborations with, um, you know, different kind of fashion brands um, and even like MasterCard and like these, all these other, you know, um, brands that you might not necessarily think of really wanting to take advantage of uh, all of the viewership that um, we had over at Riot for Worlds and all of the other major tournaments that we ran. And so, you know, tons of, tons of stuff, um, just being with that crew uh, and in that business and seeing the reality of, um, you know, this kind of exchange between digital goods uh, and real economy and all of those kinds of 
of items. Yeah, there's some amazing titles that have observed and worked on, Tony. Um, and Oliver, in, was your sort of watershed moment, did that involve African life or was predated that? No, it was actually before that. I, I think for me, definitely the, 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 the big moment was when on mobile free to play started to kind of really kick off because you know it it always requires like huge economies of scale to kind of make it really work for everybody um and you know i i, I did feel like mobile kind of or especially kind of free to play on mobile kind of started to enable that and that was like 2012 2013 before that on ios it was still like premium games for i don't know either a dollar or five dollars or even more um you know but that was like these were small numbers and then suddenly everything was free and you know the the install numbers started to kind of go crazy and uh some some game companies uh then started to make a lot of money yeah. Yeah, definitely huge huge amounts of use numbers like you say every, everyone has a mobile yeah uh, Alexa, yeah. Or Mason? Oh, sorry. oh go ahead sorry <clears throat> Yeah, from, from my perspective, as someone who spent a significant portion of their childhood playing uh, RuneScape, which is a massive multiplayer online game, the idea of a digital economy always kind of made sense, but it was this thing that was very uh, secluded to the actual game makers. And when a, a project uh, in game called Decentraland came along and they started auctioning off real estate and items that anyone could own and trade that's when i kind of had the the light bulb go off per se and realized the potential of how broad a virtual economy could get yeah there's yeah, decentraland uh if people love holding these digital assets and these items um and i think they've had their own fashion shows as well um yeah so it's definitely fashion is an angle we'll come back to um and finally alexa yes you've got uh <laughs> Um, a lot of IPs there to potentially touch on. Yeah, I mean, for I think for Blizzard, as many other um, uh, digital native companies, uh, it's very hard to say that, yes, that was the moment of truth. Um, because when you have your own platform and you natively sort of, your business is 90% digital or 99% digital, um, you know, and Blizzard was extremely successful with the Warcraft uh, with uh, picking it. I think 11 or 10 million subscribers, I don't remember, I think 10, 10.5 million subscribers. Um, that was a moment when we were like, oh my God, that's unbelievable, right? So it's, and I, of course that was 100% digital, right? Um, but I think for me personally, I had, you know, a couple of stories. One uh, is sort of thinking how uh, digital and, and real economies converge. Um, I was reading a story about CCP, the game even online, and there was they were talking about a game. You know, every every time you go online, you read a story about the biggest ever game in even online. It was always the biggest ever. So that was one of the biggest ever at that moment. And this news line was like, I don't remember exact number, but something like half a million dollars assets were destroyed during that battle. So just just mind blowing, right? So the virtual ships having a real value just because you can trade you know uh, even line you can trade gold into real money they have a system for it so you can actually calculate the the exact real value and that was a moment like whoa my god and that was actually blown away right so half a million dollars of assets were actually blown away in a space combat so that was pretty cool another uh, you know more business related note i i met a um not really a friend acquaintance um i know in russia whom I haven't met for many years. And suddenly, you know what? He he and his company made a game called Gardenscape. And he's a he's a billionaire. And he doesn't own like a diamond mine or a oil factory like Russian billionaires do. He just makes digital things like a small, simple game. And suddenly he's a billionaire. So that was another moment where I was like, okay. So well, it's, it's definitely, I think more and more people are having those sort of watershed moments and realizing that either digital is where it's at, um, you either build your world or get involved in, in one of these worlds. Um, I'd love to hear a, a bit from you, Oliver, about you know, how African life um, evolved, um, especially the sort of interest from you know, brands and companies that should, aren't, aren't, haven't traditionally been digital, haven't traditionally been involved in gaming. Um, I know specific fashion brands like Hellbunny and Dynamite have partnered 
with Avic in life? Like what draws companies like that to your game? And what benefits are they kind of bringing to users? And what conversations are you having with them? Well, I mean, if it's it's a it's a real world simulation um so therefore it kind of lends itself much easier i would say to kind of known brands to kind of bridge this uh, this gap between uh, real world and and digital you know i mean like uh, gucci in world of warcraft would somehow feel a bit odd right so or uh, i mean in in kind of sci-fi environment maybe yes but you know for us being a real world simulation and also being very grounded and the avatar as the centerpiece of everything, you know, um, that's where people try to express themselves and kind of, as as we all do, send signals to other people, in this case, avatars, and that also, obviously, you define yourself also with with the clothes you wear. If you kind of wear, like, noob t-shirts, everybody knows, okay, you're not super exciting here, maybe, <laughs> right? So, um, so, yeah, that's, and uh, for us, it was, it was good to kind of uh, bring in, um, yeah, real world brands and 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 fashion brands to kind of bridge that really uh, and make it also a bit more authentic for uh, for our users, so to say. We we do operate also quite a large number of virtual brands that don't exist in real world, and maybe one day we'll experiment to kind of bring that into into the real world. Like uh, Glue Mobile is now trying with their some of their design home uh, virtual assets. But I think for us, the focus is a bit more actually on rather, uh, you know, offer a, a providing more of a platform where also kind of those people that are really interested in can actually contribute as well. Like uh, Mason was saying earlier, you know, his watershed moment when it becomes decentralized, when actually, you know, you can actually also really contribute and probably in some form of economy, can also benefit from it. That's actually, that's something where we're even more excited about, yeah. Well, that's, that's something I'd like to touch on later as well, but in terms of the, these, these companies, these brands you work with, are they approaching you? Do they understand the value proposition at this stage or you know, did the conversation start off with you reaching out and saying, we have these users, they like you know, wearing these cosmetics? Yeah, I think that's that's definitely how it started, <laughs> for sure. We were we were the ones who had to kind of advocate people and say like, hey, actually, we do have quite a number of users, and you know, it's it's not the typical gamer audience because our audience is is female um, and much more into kind of fashion and cosmetic brands and all these kind of things. And we do a lot of research to kind of really understand also what kind of brands they're interested in and these kind of things. So we did kind of have to, in, at the beginning, kind of pitch this. Uh, and that, that's, you know, it feels like an educational process. Um, and that has definitely changed. You know, it's, it's obviously easier if you say like, well, you know, we have um, Nike in here or Super Dry or these kind of things. That's kind of nice um and and definitely makes it makes it easier and then there is also a point in time where then also sometimes the brands come to us and say like hey actually we're quite interested in this um you know we were unfortunately we had really bad timing but we had that for example with For forever 21 and then they had like massive problems in the us and all the conversations collapsed um but it would have been a, a great uh, collaboration <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, Tony, I remember when uh, the, the, the digital-only Nike sneaker was announced for Fortnite, um, one analyst, I think it was a Bloomberg article, said it was a, a genius move by, I think, Nike. I think it was a genius move by Nike. Didn't say genius move by Fortnite. <laughs> um, but obviously now you've had events like the incredible Travis Scott um, concerts. And what, what, are the, what is the interest you're seeing? Is it getting the brand into the world of Fortnite? Or is it you're running events and sort of interacting with consumers, um, and or more generally, actually broadly across the across Epic, the partnerships in general? Uh, I think um, general interest has uh, kind of continued to grow uh, beyond just um, let's say uh, a brand name like Nike, um, and yeah, you know we're, we're absolutely um, thrilled that. Uh, we we have a partner like that and, and the partners that we have, you know, I mean, um, obviously we work very closely together whenever we do a collaboration and, you know, we're happy to highlight, um, you know, the, the marketing genius and the brilliance of our partners for sure um, and, and their products. 
Um, I think you're going to see uh, an increased uh, range of things. It's not, you know, we've gone into the music space, that being one, uh, it, movies, movie trailers kind of being, you know, another space that we're playing around with. But if you think about um, the, the public state, publicly stated goal of the company to you know, build the metaverse, um, it, it's no secret that, you know, in that, is the broadest range of experiences that we would want people to create um, and to be a part of and to participate in. And that the digital economy around that is something we absolutely have a responsibility to nail and get right. And um, it, it's uh, it's primary for us. And so, you know, we expect there to be a very broad range of interests, different kinds of companies looking to create different kinds of and even if you take a look at um, the Unreal Marketplace today, the Unreal Engine Marketplace, people are already creating digital assets uh, for developers to use in their games or other experiences um, that they can make a living off of. Um, and you know, we support the idea of being able to give people um, you know, these kinds of creative jobs in which they're able to support themselves, maybe build a company one day, uh, we really do believe in the uh, democratization of, uh, you know, these efforts and, and of, a, of a wider digital economy. And since, since this is oh, it's a bit accurate. Um, since it's a digital fashion conference, uh, Alexei, um, well, you have lots of IPs, but uh, in terms of World of Warcraft, there's this a very established tradition there of um, using the dressing rooms, of showing your identity. And it seems to me at least you know, that aspect of your know, users enjoying the game has kind of prompted Blizzard to develop down that line. And um, what are the kind of most exciting sort of forms of self-expression you've seen across you know, the uh, World of Warcraft, but also perhaps you know, the broader uh, Blizzard portfolio? Yeah, I think uh, that's that's a great example on how important self-expression is because that transmogrification feature was added into the game. It's vastly popular, and there's a there's a lot of um, you know items that are on sale. They just modify the way your character looks without adding any uh, practical benefit uh, and that came out of uh, you know people just dressing in something um, not very useful in game but looking very cool and we thought like yeah that's something that people probably will enjoy when you can just use your great look but also use a functional item uh, but if you go through to that route I think um, what what really is important for for the gaming company to start thinking is how we empower our community to for self-expression, how we can support uh, and amplify their creativity. Um, talking on the convergence of real world and um, um, the virtual world, I think a great example is cosplayers because you know we we are really proud of uh, our cosplayers. We have you know BlizzCon conference where we have. Now used to have rather in um, in normal times where people would walk on stage and show their costumes and people would spend hundreds of hours just crafting those uh, real replicas of virtual characters and their dresses and you know and makeup they do that sort of you know opposite direction but still prove the thesis how important uh, that or rather how ephemeral become the boundaries between virtual world and real world in terms of collaboration uh, I think another interesting example of bringing virtual world into real world was the partnership we had with Kellogg's for Lucio O, that, you know, serials that were based on Overwatch character that, that were available in the US only, I think. I don't think they were available anywhere outside of the US. And we had equally fun uh, partnership with Coca-Cola where we branded all Sprite cans with Overwatch. Uh, so that was also pretty cool. That's really awesome. And Mason, at Masari, you're constantly watching how you both consumers interact with digital assets and also you know, larger companies and enterprises. You know, what, what are the most exciting sort of trends and sort of interactions with virtual goods that you're interested in? It comes down to the permissionless nature of being able to interact with goods uh, across different platforms. And so you have uh, these standards that can exist on blockchains. And so you can you know, take it from one game to the next uh, as a potential like trend that that is pretty interesting. And then uh, apart from just what you can do with with actual digital assets, I think that the shift in consumer behavior is really fascinating to watch. You have an entire generation that's growing up 
with you know Fortnite cosmetics being a totally normal purchase that you're going to make when you're 12, 13, 14 years old and how that consumer behavior evolves, whether it becomes as badges or experiences that are crafted both digitally and in the physical realm and, and how that kind of interacts is really fascinating to, to watch. So it's, a, it's a fascinating space. And um, when you talk about those digital natives, I have nieces and nephews who like they're, they'd rather have V-Bucks than um, you know, dollars. Right. <laughs> that, that's their currency. And also seeing them interact with these these virtual spaces, these games in their own ways. Um, they, they can spend hours um, you're just creating a character um, and then watching it walk around. It's a, you know, it's a virtual doll. It's not Skyrim, <laughs> uh, which which is which is wonderful to see. Um, I'm both uh, Tony, both uh, you and Oliver mentioned sort of opening up these digital economies. Um, you know, going forward, it's going to be you know, harder and harder to be you know, to be a human being and sort of escape the metaverse. You know, all these different virtual experiences. So, how how do you make sure that we're we're not we're having inclusive digital economies and we're really empowering people to be creative? And participate and not having sort of friction. Uh, I don't know who who wants to kick that off. It could really be anyone. I can kick off. I mean, it's it's um, you know we we didn't uh, let's say we didn't have it in our DNA on day one, right? We 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 didn't start off like maybe more like a Rob, Roblox or Minecraft or whatever, where it was you know a, a much more of a platform uh, where where the users were basically creating all the content, everything, etc. So. We were kind of in, in in the early days the ones that were kind of providing all the content, but it was always somewhere written on the horizon, and we we have started that um, with kind of working with much more. I mean, because as I said at the very beginning, we sell about two point three million um, virtual items um, a day uh, for for virtual for virtual currency. So that's not all real world dollars or something, but. Um, it's a lot of items that kind of people kind of experiment with. And that means we also have to kind of provide them a lot of, you know, content uh, all the time. And it kind of, we have, uh, you know, a bunch of fashion designers in-house, but we've also kind of, uh, you know, collaborated with quite a few designers. We didn't go, you know, get exclusivity with Nike because we're not as big as Fortnite and maybe it's not exactly our audience, but we have worked with some, you know, up and coming smaller designers um, um, that that we found um, out there um, and that are definitely struggling because there are no big fashion shows and all these kind of things. So for us to kind of collaborate with these and kind of have them also kind of the design um, items for our audience and these kind of things, that was super cool. And it shows, it kind of paves the way. And now it's about like, okay, how do we enable more people to do that, and also uh, ultimately our users. So that's kind of our our route, I would say. Yeah, but we're we're still there is still some way to go. Let's put it that way. <laughs> awesome. I, I think for us, and I'm you know I'm not going to speak for for Tim here. I think he's got a really great talk. If anyone wants to listen to it afterwards on the metaverse economy, but some of the larger themes that I've seen from Epic as a company. Um, that I think are important for our future and I, and I don't think will change. Um, number one will be um, the empowerment uh, for people to create. Um, Tim's always had a big heart for developers and really giving them the best tools possible via the Unreal Engine. And, you know, we, we have a history of kind of moving that more and more, uh, you know, to be more and more user-friendly and accessible because that's really, you know, what's... Um, Kind of what's what's in his heart is to make that super easy for um, anybody to pick up and use and that a bunch of creative people who might not know a bunch of code can get their hands on a very powerful tool and begin to create some really cool experiences or items um, you know within the the digital space with it so i think just empowering people to be creative is a huge thing and being generous in that right like you can pick up the tools and, and start developing with them without paying any subscription fees or costs. Um, you know, if you just wanna play around, anyone can just go down, uh, download the Unreal Engine today and just start messing around with it and seeing what you can make, which is you know, a pretty fun experience. Um, so I think you know, giving people really powerful tools and freedom to be able to create. And then that generosity carrying over, not just through the creation process, but once somebody starts participating and like selling digital items, 
that we have very, very fair, not just fair, but I, in my opinion, like as a former indie dev, like generous business practices, um, you know, uh, if you um, build something, a uh, product with the Unreal Engine and you start selling stuff, it's, it's just a 5% cut, right? Um, and you get this awesome tool with all of the features updated for as long as, you know, Epic's gonna be around. Um, and if you build a game or something and distribute it to uh, the Epic Game Store, you don't have to pay the, the, the 5% fee is waived. You just pay 12% fee, right, overall for everything all the way through distribution. So, you know, I think that generosity is key. It's like making sure people can really build strong businesses or even individual, you know, businesses and brands um, so that they can participate, whether that be part-time or full-time or I want to build a company off of this stuff. Uh, I think we need to be able to empower people to, to do all those things. Awesome. And uh, yeah, definitely recommend uh, yeah, Tim Sweeney speaks really, really, <laughs> uh, really well about the metaverse and about you know, his, his vision uh, and the company's vision in terms of opening up digital economies. Um, Alexei or Mason, do you want to take the conversation further? Um, sure. I um, most important, I think, for a gaming company going forward, and that's the foundation of longevity and um, success of eventual success of a game is building the community. Right. Um, that means engaging with the community, and most importantly, giving them an opportunity to engage with your product, engage with your brand in a new and creative ways, finding ways to empower them, giving them new tools. Um, and eventually contributing to the game development, actually. Uh, that may not be just directly going and inputting games into the product itself, because there can be certain challenges to that, but at least providing ideas, creative ideas, and we've seen so many uh, of them coming from our fans that the devs totally took an, an inspiration from, and some of them actually in a different shape or form made it into the game as well. I've, you know, I think Blizzard has always been super collaborative with the community. We always always listen to the feedback and iterate it on the games so many times um so i think that's critical um and uh, you know sometimes with just to you know um creativity uh, of our fans just just you know it's just mind-blowing what they can create and what they can do so it's, it's amazing when you open up people's creativity um giving them the access to uh, this world of you know, digital economy uh, Mason, what, what can we do to, what, what are you seeing that we can do to enable more and more people to participate? Because I know it's still, uh, you know, from our side of the blockchain, there's still quite a few elements of friction there. Yeah, I, I think that beyond the user uh, frictions that kind of exist in adapting like games for uh, the blockchain world, I think that Alexi kind of hit it on the head where it's really the community that matters. And if you can incentivize your users to not only want to give back to the game, uh, but also, like Tony said, an opportunity to really make money, then you're, there's no better thing you can do for the, the long-term viability of, of your game or for your game studio. Awesome. And, and uh, we're, we're overrunning a bit due to my technical difficulties, but because there was already a lot of great content in this conference, I know you have to jump shortly, Tony, so I'm going to uh, pick you to tell me What's like looking forward? What's the technology you're most excited about for driving your further value creation within virtual economies? And maybe, maybe you can't say Unreal Engine. Let's say let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think um, I think it's going to be very very important for people to have security um, of an online identity um, in which they can protect. And um, I've always told a bunch of my friends, like, look, someone go invent this because I got no idea how to do it, but like create a gamer tag or an, an online ID that's in the blockchain and, um, you know, let people monetize their own PII. I want to set like five tiers of my own information and, you know, my preferences or whatever it is. And I can self monetize, um, you know, kind of like UBI is like sort of just the idea is like built into that. But like companies are paying me for my data. I, I make money off of it. 
I can go spend it and do other things with it. And the reason I think that's like interesting and foundational is if you're going to have digital items, blockchain technology again is is really important in making sure that if you're going to carry these items across any number of experiences that they are protected from, you know, and if you want to talk about anything like true, true digital exclusivity or scarcity, you're going to need uh, ways to protect it and to make sure that um, these things are secure, right? And I think that, that for me, that, that kind of uh, tech is important both for uh, uh, people's um, right to monetize their own information um, and also to uh, keep their digital, all their digital stuff uh, together and secure, right, uh, tied to them. Awesome. Well, uh, definitely a lot of people we were hanging on to the blockchain aspect <laughs> of that response. And do do feel to jump, feel free to jump off, Tony, um, if uh, you need to go. Mason, uh, similar question for you. I think it'd be unfair to maybe rule out you know, blockchain uh, as a whole. Um, but if, if there's something else you're excited about or a very specific part of uh, blockchain technology that uh, you think is going to drive you know, huge value creation. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'm excited for uh, a, a lot of things within like the blockchain space as it applies to gaming. Uh, one, one in particular are uh, the, I would say, ways that experiences get combined with gaming. So whether it's you have some sort of uh, digital representation that you were at some raid battle or uh, that you were part of some guild and I think that finding ways to kind of build those community experiences uh, with whether it's like digital tokens, NFTs, or, or what have you is something I'm, I'm really excited about. Yeah, certainly the, the, the meaning that people if, like assign to these virtual goods and either, even these blockchain items, these collectibles, they have a huge amount of meaning just by owning it. It says a lot about you and where you were. Um, it's great to see a knowledge in virtual environments. Um, Alexei, when we when we spoke before, um, you I think we, we we spoke about how technology can also move too fast and leave different groups behind um, in terms of you know, jumping into uh, your new technology like VR. Um, but is 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 there a technology you think is is driving a lot of value creation that you can see Blizzard moving in, um, or is it important to maintain those communities and not sort of advance too too rapidly? Yeah, I think uh, personally, I'm a huge enthusiast of any new tech, and I think gaming has been making huge progress, leaps and bounds, just unbelievable, right? What what progress we made for the last five, ten years. Um, but of course, you have to be cautious because what we always wanted to do is just making sure we are available uh, to our community on the device they prefer. Um, so I think that's important to make sure those barriers separating the community from each other and are as low as possible. And that means adopting any new technology as a must have is a bit challenging because then you're locked first in a very small group of people that ha can have access to that technology. Because normally if you're talking about cutting edge, then it's, you know, it's not, it's not, it's either expensive or just not available. So that's one thing that sort of, um, that's why Blizzard is moving maybe a bit slower on going into and rolling into new uh, environments, but that absolutely, I think, is going to change. And I'm personally super excited about VR and how that's going to evolve and how that's going to look like in the short term future. But if we talk about the technology that I think will have a massive impact of gaming, I think it's going to be 5G. It's just going to be the the moment of truth, I think, once that becomes accessible for everyone. and that level of data, you know, fast uh, data exchange will, I think, spiral game into totally new heights. That's for sure. I think it's going to be, that's much more immediate than uh, VR, for instance, which still requires a lot of, um, you know, um, time to actually evolve into into that level to become mass adopted. But 5G, I'm, I'm absolutely positive that's going to be a turning moment for gaming. It's going to be very, that's going to be, I think some people haven't really figured out just how quite transformative that can and will be. Uh, so, so it's great to have that raised. And uh, Oliver, what, what can we expect uh, from Avakin Life? Is it, is it going to be you know, the completely different experience that I can you know, live in a virtual space? Yeah, I mean, 
I, I, I think like Alexei was saying, I was going to say 5G generally, but um, I'm not going to say that now. Um, I think uh, <laughs> Sorry. VR, as Alexei was saying, is has the challenge of being quite niche. There is no killer application or anything like that yet that would kind of transform it to, to mass adoption. I do think, therefore, it's probably going to be rather like I would say like proper cloud gaming, so where it's like it doesn't matter what device, but you know you can play from wherever on whatever device, and it's always going to be like a, a very similar experience. Um, your kind of in input and output might be a little bit different, so there will be preferred kind of ways to kind of play games for sure, depending on what game it is. But that actually it it doesn't really matter. It's always going to be the same the same experience. I think that's. And a 5G would enable that. Uh, bef with without 5G, that's going to be very, very difficult. I, th I think. Um, for us, it's it's really kind of um, so for for Avakin, it is uh, you know allowing um, people, and it was mentioned that it is obviously challenging, but allowing people to create content themselves and kind of participating in the economy. That's that's definitely the the goal for us as well. Um, yeah, that's where we're going. And once we have that, that's, that's going to be a big, uh, a big transformative yeah. moment. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a huge amount of creativity being unleashed. Have we been kicked out? Yeah, I've been. I think so. Okay. Oh, so, uh, sorry, Emma. Um, I've just got to thanks for attending the event. Uh, thank you, guys. If you can hear me, thank you for joining. Yeah. And great discussion. Welcome. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.